It's a real honor to be here today to speak about AI and medicine. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm actually what you might call a serial entrepreneur, um, which means they focus on innovating new technologies from within Google. So I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, building healthier ecosystems using AI and human-centered design. As a tech person, it's tempting to believe that you can drop tech into any situation and have it serve a need. Um, but healthcare is actually, we found, a very complex living system that's extremely hard to get right. And for AI to make a positive difference, it's imperative we actually consider the ecosystem around it. And so, uh, what's that ecosystem look like? I'm going to compare the US healthcare system really quickly to the next 10 highest income countries. So it is, we are spending 17.8% 17 .8 of our GDP on healthcare, so we rank first in spend, um, but we do have the worst for many population health outcomes, including infant mortality and life expectancy. And so in our journey to understand why that was the case, um, we found that patients are only getting about half the care that they, the recommended care that they should. At the same time, uh, we saw that sometimes we're over-prescribing certain procedures and medications, and while the total volume of care is not dissimilar to other countries, um, uh, we were actually seeing relatively higher prices. And lastly, the U.S. suffers from the same problems of medical errors as the rest of the world. And so these are all problems, actually, as you heard earlier, that AI should fundamentally be able to help with scaling, tailoring to the individual, reducing costs, and reducing the false positive and negatives. Um, so we focused our mission on improving the availability and accuracy of care using machine learning uh, to improve patient lives. But to, in order to achieve this mission, we realized that machine learning was not enough. Uh, you have to understand how it will impact the patients and clinicians that use it. Um, so what we found was that ML must be paired with human-centered design. This is how we ensure we're having a real positive impact. We have four guiding principles for human-centered studies that we've discovered to be effective for developing AI technologies. They revolve around working with domain experts to design the right ML models, um, doing human-computer interaction research, um, which is really about knowing your user and uh, how they think. Uh, ethnographic field studies, we do that as well. Um, we, that allows us to understand the environment in which we're deploying the AI model, and collaborative design, working together with the end user to create better workflows. And so I'll start with the first two, um, using Dybeknopthias uh, to highlight these human-centered design principles. Uh, specifically, uh, I want to mention how pivotal ethnographic studies can be for ensuring effective deployment. And also, I'll talk a little bit about the relationship between AI models and how the domain expert evolves to learn from each other in a virtuous way. So for diabetic renopathy, uh, uh, it's the leading growing cause of blindness, and it's a very treatable uh, disease if you detect it early. Uh, despite d DR being a treatable disease, um, uh, you have 450 million people with diabetes. One out of three have uh, uh, diabetic renopathy, so around 100 million people, and only half the people know it. So typically, the most effective strategy for tackling this is to deploy large-scale um, screening programs, especially in developing countries like India. Um, however, when we went on site for the ethnographic uh, studies, we've learned exactly how much of a shortage do of do eye doctors there were. And so you can see the photo that we took at the time, the queues out the door. This results in very delayed screenings or no screenings at all. So it became quite pivotal, pivotal in our deployment strategy to understand the regional and societal constraints. And what we did was actually build a tool that would enable the current doctors, eye doctors, to be able to take care of those patients and take care of more of them. Um, so a bit about the model we developed. Uh, it's a convolutional neural network um, that learns from examples, and so we previously had it trained on photos of cats and dogs, and now we trained it to predict the severity of diabetic renopathy. Uh, AI is really effective for these types of problems. Um, you saw earlier that uh, you can get to be on par with ophthalmologists. We have an F-score of 0.95, which is a function of precision recall. Uh, the dots that you see are individual ophthalmologists and their performance compared to the model. And so for those of you who are building ML models, you know that uh, the model is only as good as the data you feed it, and the uh, closer you are to the ground truth and the representation of what is actually a truth, the better your data will be, or the better your model will be. And so we work with uh, domain experts 
uh, to actually arrive there. And you heard a little bit earlier about um, the adjudication process um, where you can actually get multiple doctors to weigh in. In this case, we built a labeling tool. I had 50, over 50 ophthalmologists use it to grade 130,000 images. Um, we had to actually end up doing about 880,000 diagnoses. Um, and that's because we did see that variability that we were mentioning earlier. So each row here is uh, a patient image, and each column is an ophthalmology grader. And we were getting about 65% intragrader uh, consistency and 60% intragrader consistency. And so what we did was we, um, uh, what we wanted to see was that you see the same color across each row. And so we uh, took the uh, discrepancies, the different uh, individual doctors who were in disagreement, and uh, ended up either using wisdom of the crowds, or in some cases, we facilitate conversations to get to uh, collective agreement. And this was uh, something that was interesting, which is that machine learning models were actually a forcing function to um, drive these kinds of debates and shared knowledge. Um, and that ends up in resulting in improved labels. Uh, something else that I want to emphasize is the importance of human-computer interaction design. Um, and this is really thinking about the relationship between the user and the machine um, and understanding those cognitive underpinnings for machine perception and how decisions are made. Um, so this can really affect how an AI model is used or potentially misused. Um, in this case, we started with uh, a machine learning model that could ac accurately predict multiple medical events using the entire longitudinal EHR data. And this was in a paper that we published with Stanford, UCSF, and University of Chicago. Uh, we sequentialized the records into a fire protocol um, and released that to, uh, the protocol is what we released to open source and GitHub so everyone can use that. And we like to build more tools around that to make that easier. We like this because uh, if the fire protocol is interoperable and, and as many of you know, we don't need more data fragmentation in this space. Um, we demonstrated that uh, if you take the machine learning methods, you can actually accurately predict multiple medical events like unexpected readmissions or length of stay. Um, but you know, you're taking all of this input of med medical records, encounters, labs, medications, vital signs, and it's going into a black box without clear attribution. So what we found in our HCI studies was that it's crucial to have an explanation and to be able to interpret the model output. Um, using attention models, we could extract from the reams of medical history uh, for a patient what the past events really, which ones really mattered in explaining the outcome. Uh, this means that doctors can now uh, make assessments um, and generate new hypotheses uh, from the information that the machine is actually predicting from. Uh, and it's, not, it's actually going to be up to the clinician to decide whether that's actually something they want to change their prognosis for. So the last quick example I'd like to give is um, our work in collaborative design. We use it to um, make sure that we develop better workflows. So it's hard as an engineer to imagine the exact pain points that the clinician faces every day. What we know is that six hours of their 11-hour workday can be spent up in can be spent in the EHR. And um, while we aren't at the point where AI can offload all of those six hours, um, we found in our uh, research uh, that it would allow us to know where in the clinical workflow uh, the pain points were and where we could actually make the most difference to start. Um, so this is where we've partnered closely with Stanford Family Medicine uh, to study how um, uh, physicians can actually be able to uh, relieve the clinical documentation burden um, and how we can facilitate the scribing process using automatic speech recognition um, and, uh, and then reimagine, hopefully, the clinical documentation workflow. So our aim is hopefully to reduce that administrative burden and give back the mind share and time to the doctor so they can focus on the patient. Uh, so it's clear that AI has the potential uh, to improve the accuracy and availability of care, but ultimately, uh, you have to focus on the people that will be impacted by the technology. And you have to partner deeply with them. So I found this to be true, not if just for healthcare, but for sustainability as well. Um, it is uh, just as complex the planet is as it's a complex living system. And so um, to kind of finish off, uh, I wanted to thank everyone who's been working with us today. Uh, none of this would be possible without the collaborations we have. And thank you for listening. <laughs>